Okay, we look at some theories behind motivation and some motivations. Let's move on to emotion now. Uh, here are the outcomes for module 41. Have a look at them so you know what we're trying to find out. So first of all, emotions are those things that we encapsulate. They, they inc include many things with this. They include, you know, uh, our physiolo physiology, um, what they do to us, our appraisal of these emotions, and, and how we actually will uh, express these emotions. And it's like a little bit of a puzzle. The question is, how does it fit together? We all have expressive behaviors of our emotion where we show them. And we also have a conscious experience. We know when we've been afraid. But how does that order happen? Well, the first couple of theories actually didn't really include cognition with it. The James Lang theory is a theory that there's a physiological response, which is what the, the emotion is. So say you're driving along and the driver cuts you off, the physiological response, your heart pounds, your sympathetic nervous kicks into play, and that is fear. The Cannon Bard theory basically says that simultaneously our appraisal of the um, the situation, say the driver cutting us off, is processed by our brain and by our physiology, our nervous system, spinal spi spinaltaneously, simultane simultaneously at the same time. So it happens right then. Okay, so those are the first historical theories, but we found, you know, sometimes cognitive appraisal has a lot to do with how, what we sense. So Schachter and Singer came up with what we call the two-factor theory, Schachter's two-factor. Okay, and in this one, what it means is we have a physiological response to a threat or whatever it is, or love or whatever emotion we're experiencing, and then we have a cognitive appraisal to say what that means. So what this theory is kind of looking at is a lot of the physiological responses to the emotions that we have are very similar, and but we need to cognitively label what that physiological response is, because perhaps fear and anger, you know, we get that our heart pounding and everything else and butterflies in our stomach, just like we do with love. So we have to appraise that that emotion. So now we've put cognition into it. Uh, Zé-Jean Ledoux and Lazarus have taken this a little bit farther and say there are times when we don't have uh, cognitive appraisal in our emotions, but a lot of times we do. And what he looked at is basically top-down and bottom-up processing of the emotion. So let's say, for example, we have a fear stimulus. Okay, so that fear stimulus is sent to our, our thalamus. Um, say it's a, you know, a complex emotion like love or something, and the thalamus will send it into our sensory cortex and through into our prefrontal cortex where we can make assumptions, we can process this information, and then we get this fear response. Okay. Um, in more simpler types of emotion, sometimes it's, it happens immediately. You know, maybe this is anger or something like that, and the, or fear, the stimulus comes in, the thalamus sends it right back down into our sympathetic nervous system and causes this response. So Ledoux calls this the high and the low road of our emotional processing. And here's kind of the Lazarus Schachter Singer is says that we have an event, we have an appraisal of event and an emotional response. Okay, the Zéjean Ledoux says there's an event, there's an emotional response. Okay, so this would be like the low road and the high road. Okay, so make sure you know those theories. They can be confusing. We can clear them up for you a little bit more in class if you have questions, but uh, they're always asked about on the AP exam. Here's a really good... Um, chart explaining all the different theories. You can see the James Lang theory, followed by the Canon Bard, the Schachter Singer, Zé Jean Ledoux, and Lazarus finally with his cogn cognitive appraisal. Okay, uh, have a look at the examples, and if you have questions, make sure that you ask about them in class, and we will clear this up a little bit if it's confusing for you. So the embodied emotion, obviously, it, it includes our, our nervous system, um, and it invokes our sympathetic nervous system, which you might remember from the biological basis of behavior videos. Um, the sympathetic is the one that stimulates, it's our fight or flight, and the parasympathetic nervous system will calm our um, after the threat is, is left. And if you remember the Yerkes-Dodson law, you know, this is the idea that we have an optimal amount of arousal that we have, um, and it, the amount of arousal 
uh, for easier tasks with less thought. The higher amount of arousal, we tend to be better at those. And if we, the, as the task becomes more complicated, we need less arousal. So it's not pumping us up to the, to the point where we're missing what we're trying to figure out or what we're trying to accomplish. So here's a quick chart. You can have a look at this. You can pause this. Uh, we've gone over this. These are the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of your nervous system once again. So the physiologic, physiology of the emotions, they all feel very similar. And in fact, a lot of them have a lot of similarities to how they work in your brain. The insula is a, a center deep in your brain that is activated when we experience many of our emotions. Um, however, we do find, you know, slight differences in these emotions as far as hormones that release or perhaps, uh, you know, uh, temperature in a finger. Um, there are slight differences. And many of you may have heard of a polygraph test where the polygraph is designed to see if you're lying or not. Um, we'll go over how that works when we're in class, but it is proven to not be effective enough to be using in courts um, as there's been lots of people have been able to beat the lie detector because they know how it works and it's it can have some false positives which will cause issues okay so the brain circuits though from the insula seems to be similar but there can be slight differences on the circuits that it happens so what we've found though uh, the left frontal lobe seems to be more involved when we have positive types of emotions you know when we're feeling good about things or there's a uh, uh, we're witnessing something positive. If it's on the negative side, it seems to be more, the right frontal lobe seems to be more in action. Okay, so the left seems to be more activated when they are positive emotions. Now, expressed emotion is basically how we communicate non-verbally. You know, and this goes back to Darwinism ideas where we had ways to uh, communicate with pre-lingual. And a lot of these uh, emotional uh, communication systems are the same throughout all cultures. Uh, for example, a smile, the Duchesne smile here, we're showing you, this is, you know, obviously showing delight. Can you tell which is the real smile and which is the fake smile? Well, the one on the, the right hand side here is the real smile because it activates muscles. It's an involuntary response. It activates some muscles that the fake smile does not. And you can really see it around his eyes in this area. The gender and emotion, there does seem to be a difference in gender with emotion. Um, we associate uh, anger and stuff more as a more of a male trait, where pleasant emotions and stuff we associate more female. When we look at this um, non-sexed, can't think of the word right now, uh, picture, uh, the same face, but we give a different expression, more people are likely to say that the image on the left is a male image and the image on the right is a female image because of the different emotions that are being expressed with the nonverbal behavior. And we also found that females will express their emotions more. These are people watching films and they're being observed how many emotional expressions that they have. And, you know, you can see in a sad movie, uh, females express sadness more and happy more and scary more. So the women, the female gender seems to express emotions more than the male gender does. However, the cultures all around the world, if we showed this to anybody, they can probably recognize the, the different expressions and what they're trying to communicate. And which leads us, you know, to the Darwinian idea again of evolution that, you know, if it's the same all over the world, this is the way that people had to communicate. Um, what's interesting, like when we have a, a, a smile, for example, when often, uh, for example, a bowler that's not looking at people, when he bowls a strike, they don't usually smile when they bowl a strike, but when they turn around to their friends and stuff, that's when the smile happens. Okay, so it's a, a method of communicating the emotion that they have rather than a reaction to the to the event. Can you name those emotions in all of these pictures? I bet you can get pretty close if you can't get them all. The the also the culture and emotional expression when we add context to it, like body language. This man has the same expression in the top photos. Uh, but we, the one we will interpret probably as disgust, whatever the heck that thing is he's holding, and the other one we'll probably interpret as anger. Just like in the bottom picture, the one with tears coming on, we had tears, and we probably will perceive that as being more sad than the other one. So there are, you know, body language cues that are happening as well. 
So our, you know, our situations will affect our emotions and our expressions, but there's also what we call a facial feedback effect. And this is actually your expressions affecting your emotions. Okay, so the facial feedback effect, uh, if we look at this diagram, when we put these rubber bands across the person's head and tape them there, it pulls their face up into a kind of a feigned smile, but it actually makes them in a better mood. They're willing to rate jokes as more funny um, than the person on the right here where it's down, where it's faking a frown. So this is one of those deals where you, you, know, you, you fake it till you make it. You want to be in a good mood when you smile. You know, if you fake a smile right now, you'll probably notice it has an emotional effect on you. And if you fake a frown, it has an emotional effect on you. So it's much better to, to try and, you know, if you're going to feign an emotion, feign the happy one and it's going to make you feel better. That's the facial feedback effect. The health psychology looks at the relationship um, between these psychological concepts and our health situation that we have. And, of course, positive attitudes lead to better health. Okay, now, as far as health goes, stress. You know, stress is our reaction to all of those uh, stressors in our lives. And, of course, all of us have stressors all the time, um, you know, and they can be from, you know, minor irritations to major life changes. Um, and, of course, we have an appraisal. You know, when we have, for example, in this here we have a stressful event, which is a tough math test. And our appraisal on the left side is yikes this is beyond me okay and so this person is stressed to distraction however on the right side the challenge is i've got to apply myself now this is difficult and that becomes an aroused and focused kind of response to the stress so our appraisal of the situation can dictate how we go about approaching whatever the problem is we have at hand so the things that push our buttons you know these can be catastrophes you know, when we hear about uh you know massive terrorist attacks uh we feel bad for them or tsunamis or earthquakes that have you know or maybe things that are even closer to home significant life changes these these may be things you know like a divorce in your family or a death in your family um these are significant life changes or you move to another location you know, our daily hassles are those things we put up all day long, every day. You know, dealing with, you know, having to feed that dog that's begging you. Daisy always does that to me. It's the only time I don't like her. She won't let me sleep because she wants to eat. Okay, and you see on this chart, it's like, you know, like after about the age of 65, it seems like those little daily stresses don't seem to be as big a deal. You'll notice around your age, there, 18 to 20 is almost the highest, gets a little bit higher. But these are daily hassles that everybody has to deal with. So they're all stressors though, and they can all take their toll. Um, and what we found, there's a guy named Hans Seeley, and he has the general ad adaptation syndrome. Now, this is something you should know because it's often on the AP test too. It is a re our body's response. It goes into an alarm response, Okay, this is where your emotions are kind of heightened, and then your body resists. Um, it, it tries to control the amount of stress that it goes through, and eventually you hang on long enough, and it goes into exhaustion, and it goes away. Um, the way to remember these three things is it's R. Okay, the general adaptation syndrome, R, the way our body deals with stress. Okay, other people, you know, and more women than men tend to do this. It's the tend and befriend. Um, we like to seek support from others. And we like to befriend others that are having difficulties. And it can help us in situations and make us feel better. And women tend to do this and befriend more often than males do. Or much more, it's put more stock in it. Here's the general adaptation syndrome again. Okay, so your body mobilizes its resources as this when the stressor occurs and then it stays in distress but it can only stay in stress so long before exhaustion sits in and your reserves are depleted okay so this you know as a, a adaptation to the stress um, our immune systems can drop and all those kinds of things and we have trouble fighting off disease and when we look at stress and illness we'll look at see how it makes us more vulnerable to disease and why some of us are more prone than others to coronary heart disease, one of our leading killers of um, third of first world countries. So psychophysiological illnesses, you know, these are ones that are, are caused by stressors. You know, so for example, some headaches are psychophysiological, or hypertension would be psychophysiological. You know, uh, illnesses brought on by stress, and 
psychoneuroimmunology is the study of how this affects our body. And we have in our body lymphocytes, which are uh, white blood cells. We, we have uh, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, macrophage, and natural killer cells. Okay, And these are all things that will help us stave off things like uh, cancer um, or other illnesses. And these tend to become depleted during stress. And we will, I'll give you a chart with uh, each of these um, uh, lymphocytes on them so you, you can remember them. So this is a simplified view of immune response. We got intruders. Look at this guy. Didn't he look sick? Oh my goodness. Okay. And, you know, is it a bacterial infection? Okay. If it is, the response your body is going to send in B lymphocytes. Okay. Is it a cancer cell? The response then is it's going to send in T lymphocytes. Okay. Or if it's another foreign substance, T lymphocytes will fight those off. Is it an other harmful intruder or perhaps a worn out cell need to be cleaned up? We send in macrophages, such as the large one shown here, which is about to trap and destroy a tiny bacterium in the lower right. Where is he? Over here somewhere. Okay. Um, are there disease cells, such as those infected by viruses or cancer, that need to be cleared out? And these are the NK cells, okay, as these ones are shown here. So they will attack a cell that's actually been infected. Okay, so this is how our immune system works. But stress can obviously lead to this because of the it, it depletes our lymphocytes. Um, the big thing we have is stress and heart disease. Coronary heart disease is the uh, number one killer of people. This is when your arteries become clogged and blocked, and your circulatory system doesn't work. You have heart attacks, and and your your heart can't your circulatory system can't keep up. Um, we find with different personalities, it makes a big difference. Uh, our type A personality. What is this one here? Our type A personality is a person that tends to get, has a high reaction. They have high temperaments. They react strongly, quickly, as opposed to our type B type of person, which has been identified as people that will kind of take things more easy as they go, take problems as they come and deal with it. And they don't tend to worry and stress as much about little things. Um, everybody deals with the stress, but the type B will handle it in a much more calm fashion, which seems to be... Um, help them. Type A's are more at risk of coronary heart disease. And we see, you know, our, our attitudes towards life. And this is, you know, how our mind will help control our body. Pessimists um, are much more likely to develop coronary heart disease than optimists. Okay. And optimists are less likely than people that are just neutral. So it's good to have an optimistic attitude besides making you feel better. It actually makes your body better and you help fight off disease that way. With stress, uh, with chronic stressors, uh, we have, you know, there's excessive inflammation occurs. It can lead to depressive symptoms, which again, leads to excessive inflammation, can lead to cardiac disease, more excessive inflammation, more depressive symptoms, and so on. So chronic stressors should probably, you know, you need to deal with these chronic stressors somehow, whether it be, you know, uh, through kind of some kind of psychotherapy or just dealing with the problem head on. Um, you probably remember from a previous unit uh, that we have problem, uh, problem based dealing with things or we have emotional based. Uh, if the problem is something that you can't make go away, then you need to deal with it in an emotional way. And you can see in this chart, it just kind of shows the release of our stress hormones. Uh, persistent stressors and negative emotions lead to unhealthy behaviors, you know, like smoking, drinking, poor nutrition, and sleep, which cause release of stress hormones. The autonomic nervous system uh, effects will give you headaches, high blood pressure, inflammation. Your immune system becomes suppressed and also leads to heart disease. So stress, no good. Okay, and we are just, we are now done, uh, unit eight. Uh, hopefully it's not too stressful for you. Uh, make sure you go back and do it. This will be our last unit before our break, our Christmas break. Um, so make sure you spend some time over the holidays kind of brushing on things. Remember the spacing effect and all of your memory stuff that we got right at the very start of the year. Okay, so I will see you guys in class. Bye for now.